my pleasure to introduce our next speaker for the afternoon, who, is, uh, who we have Jason Pell, who is a graduate student in the Computer Science Department at Michigan State University, and he's Lansing, working with Titus Brown, um, and he's going to talk about a problem that dovetails very nicely uh, with the previous talk, which is uh, the digital immobilization of genome sequencing data. Thank you. Thanks, Fernando. Uh, I, I'm glad that uh, Siv gave a good uh, introduction to uh, some of the uh, issues in next generation sequencing. Uh, there's a little bit of overlap with uh, what I'll be talking about as far as background, but um, the focus uh, of this talk is mostly on handling uh, metagenomic data, and I'll, I'll go into that uh, later on as to what metagenomics actually is and uh, how it's maybe not the, the best term since it's not really meta, but uh, I'll get into that in a second. So. Our problem in the lab, at least one of the um, issues that, that we are trying to address, is how can we come up with good metagenomic assemblies? And th this boils down to the classic assembly problem that uh, has been around for the past couple decades. And uh, as Sid mentioned before, we have you know, an original DNA sequence, and then this gets shredded up uh, by uh, by whatever sequencing platform, uh, Illumina 454, these are some of the, the newer names, or uh, PacBio and the uh, USB thumb drive that, um, that was mentioned previously. But there, there's a bunch of different methods to come up with fragments. And next generation sequencing really results in error prone short reads. And Nowadays, uh, Illumina produces maybe 100 base pair to 150 base pair reads. Uh, PacBio can produce much longer reads, but they're much more error prone. So it's kind of a weird situation where the classic technology, which is called Sanger, is uh, it produces long reads, about 1,000 base pairs, but it's actually much more accurate. The, the whole, only issue is that it's much more expensive. So uh, biologists are drawn to next generation sequencing because it's much more cost effective and if you have a non-model organism, uh, you, you know, using next generation sequencing is in your budget while Sanger sequencing is pretty much out of the question. So this is uh, what a, a FASTA file looks like uh, if you have a DNA sample and you go to a, a sequencing facility, uh, you might get a file back in FASTA format, uh, it, you'd probably get quality information as well, and that'd be in uh, FASTQ. There, there's other formats over, uh, available, but this is a, a pretty simple one. Uh, you just have the name of the read, and then uh, in this case, looks like that's about 60 base pairs. And you, you, depending on how much sequence you generate, you can end up with millions of reads or billions of reads. And what we do in uh, handling this type of data is uh, we break up the read into cameras, which uh, was mentioned in the previous talk as well. And so this highlighted in red here is a 20 mer. So if we set k equal to 20, we go along a sliding window and take all of these 20 mers and then load them into, uh, in this case, a count min sketch, which was you know discussed in depth in the uh, talk this morning. And we've been using a count min sketch or a counting bloom filter uh, quite a lot for the past two or three years and it, it's really enabled us to do a lot more than um, other labs have been able to do with the, the same amount of compute power. Uh, and, and so I, I'm just glad that you know it's still being discussed and uh, um, that you know other people are taking advantage of the data structure. So uh, anyway, um, DNA assembly is, is very difficult, um, primarily because of base calling errors, as I was uh, mentioning before. And th those can also be caused by sequencing platforms. Each sequencing platform has a different error profile. And so Illumina, uh, the ends of the reads are more error prone. Um, and that, that's pretty much the case for all of the sequencing platforms, but each has its own uh, technical difficulty that 
uh, it is difficult to, to generalize. And another problem is repeats. And that's especially a problem in, uh, in mammalian genomes, especially human, where you know, up to 50% of the genome is repetitive. And so if you're breaking up a repetitive region into camers, it's very difficult to unravel you know, how big that repetitive region is when you have so many more errors. Because uh, if you have a deep coverage of a repetitive area, um, you, you get tons more errors. And of course, that will lead to a more complex assembly graph. And so uh, it, it's pretty much the case that uh, DNA sequence assemblers pretty much choke on repetitive regions. And it's uh, very difficult to get a good assembly um, in repetitive regions. But a lot of uh, recent sequencing efforts, like the human gut microbiome, uh, human resequencing, and the cow rumen, uh, they've all needed 512 gigabyte machines to assemble their data sets. And the, the issue is that this is really not sustainable, uh, given that uh, the sequencing technologies are only producing more and more data. Uh, we, we really need to develop new algorithms to properly handle these data sets. Now, it's uh, particularly difficult in metagenomics. Um, and it's probably better termed ensemble sequencing, which is basically where you uh, sequence an environmental sample like soil or, or just you know, get a water sample from the sea and you want to find out what microbes are, are in that sample. Uh, when you do that, there, there is a whole lot of different coverage levels between uh, different you know, species in the sample. So you could have a, a dominant uh, type of microbe that uh, you typically sequence more of than other uh, microbes. But th th this kind of relates to the challenge of uh, RNA-seq that was mentioned before because you, know, you have uh, you know, some genes that are expressed more than others and if you want to get all of the novelty in a sample, you, you really have to sample deeply, but then that relates back to the problem where you know, some areas get covered more and they get more errors and then you have a complex graph. So you know, it, it's really like you can't win either way. And uh, metagenomics is also very important because 99%, uh, it's estimated that 99% of microbes cannot be cultured in a laboratory. So you know, E. coli is one example of, a, of an exception to that rule where you can you know, put it on a petri dish and it'll, it'll grow and you can sequence it and you know you can poke it and do whatever and you know study it in detail but the vast majority of microbes we, we cannot do that kind of analysis and sequencing it is uh, right now the only way to access uh, you know what's going on in a, a, a sample so uh, another side note is uh, I guess one of the interesting facts that I learned, uh, you know, as a computer scientist learning biology, is that for every one human cell in the body, uh, there are ten microbial cells. And you know, given that 99% of microbes can't be cultured in a lab, you know, we, we know quite a lot less about you know the human ecosystem than uh, you might think. So, in our case, what we are studying is soil metagenomes and. This is part of a uh, collaboration with the Department of Energy Joint Genome Institute uh, and Lawrence Berkeley National Lab where we obtained soil, soil metagenomes from uh, Wisconsin, Iowa, and Kansas. Uh, the, the goal is to compare uh, soil treatments. So, you know, what's in prairie soil versus uh, soil that's been uh, farmed or, you know, maybe uh, <coughs> Uh, a place that was restored to uh, switch grass or, or something like that. Essentially, we want, we want to find out, you know, how how uh, the microbes in soil change um, during different uh, or in different treatments. So they they generated a lot of data for us, and uh, meta hit on the top here is the human gut microbiome sequencing project, and that generated 578 gigabase pairs of data. So uh, that's almost a petabase, or uh, I guess a trillion base pairs of data. And uh, 
in our case, there's this dark green uh, here, and that's uh, the latest sequencing that, that was given to us, and then the lighter green is, uh, it, it's the same sample, but it's a, a slightly older Illumina platform. But you can see that they've given us tons of data and uh, not a lot of computational resources to actually analyze it. And uh, so Rumen is another uh, example where they, they took cow, they got the metagenome from a cow rumen and uh, this was published in Science and they required a 512 gigabyte machine. Same with the uh, MetaHit. And, and so we, we didn't really have the computational resources to handle this because soil is a whole lot more diverse than cow rumen or uh, human, uh, the human gut. So we, we had to, we ended up using a Kalman sketch and uh, we, we really had to look at the data in a different way. So knowing, looking, looking ahead, we realized that, you know, sequencing is becoming cheaper. People are only going to sequence more and we can't just store the entire assembly graph in memory or just error correct and then load that in or, you know, quality filter. You really have to look at it in a different way. And so, you know, a primary reason why I'm here is to, uh, you know, try and think about next generation sequencing data as a streaming problem rather than a problem where we, you know, have the data, data set on disk and, you know, we load that in and analyze it and, you know, leave it on the disk. Instead, uh, we think that uh, we, it's better to throw out memory or throw out data rather than, you know, hold on to it because it's very easy to generate more. And uh, it was mentioned previously that, you know, these algorithms should be the case where, you know, as n increases, you should get a better result. But in fact, some assemblers, when you, you know, throw all of the data at the, the assembler, you actually get a poorer assembly than if you just randomly select half of the, the reads. And so that's really just not acceptable, but it's really the reality because you know, that, that's just how the algorithms are, uh, how they function. They expect a certain coverage level. And you know, for metagenomics um, or you know, even just genomics where there are a lot of errors and uh, highly complex regions in the graph, you know, that's just uh, the way it is. And so th this graph was uh, shown in the previous talk as well. And you know, at genomics conferences, it's, you, this type of graph is always meant or met with eye rolls and, and that kind of thing. But uh, it, it is important just because it shows that uh, you know, it, it really doesn't make sense. It's not going to make sense to store this type of data on a hard disk when you can pretty much just regenerate the sample. And you know, if uh, the thumb drive sequencer is in vaporware, you know, you can just have it get sequenced right off of your laptop. So uh, I just want to cut back to soil. Uh, soil is very diverse. There are millions of species or microbiologists tend to call it uh, operational taxonomic units just because the definition of species is very, very fuzzy. But you know, as, as you add the number of sequences, it really, there, there's just tons of tons more novelty, and um, with, with the data that we have, uh, and this isn't really representative of that, but we really just always keep finding novelty the more that we sequence uh, in soil. And even though the idea of coverage is a little bit strange in, in the context of metagenomics, um, we, we don't think that we've re really reached like 1x coverage uh, of some of our soil metagenome data sets. So what, what we have developed in this lab, in, in Titus Brown's lab, is a very simple idea. Uh, he calls it a digital normalization. And essentially, essentially what we do is we go through every single read in the data set. So recall back from, the, uh, from earlier when I showed the FASTACE uh, file. And we basically check and see what the median camera count is. So we go through and get the abundance level from the count min sketch um, for each camera, and then find the median. And if it's below some cutoff, then we'll actually update the counts, you know, load the cameras into the, uh, the count min sketch, and then you know, we, we keep the read. But otherwise, we just throw it out and 
you know, that that's essentially the, where the, the streaming idea comes from. And the idea here is that you know, in, in soil or other uh, environmental samples, we want to even out the coverage level between different species. So if, if you have you know, a species A that is you know, 10 times as abundant as a, a species B, uh, the idea of digital normalization is that we throw out all of this unnecessary data and uh, try and feed an assembler something more sane that just has a, a more even coverage level. And depending on if you're sequencing uh, you know, E. coli or some other genome or a mRNA-seq sample or uh, you know, a metagenome, you, you have very different uh, distributions depending on you know, what, what it is that you're sequencing. But once you apply digital normalization, it evens out the, the coverage level so that it's all the same in, in your you know, leads data set. And so in this case, all of these, uh, these three data sets were pulled together and then uh, digital normalization was applied to them all at once and but we get a similar distribution. Uh, another advantage to digital normalization is that uh, it, it, if you think about just the true 20 mers in a data set like uh, you know, the E. coli genome, um, even if you, you know, sequence with 100x coverage, uh, you know, the E. coli genome, you still get some 20 mers, true 20 mers that didn't actually exist, or that should exist in the data set, but that just didn't get sampled properly. But when we apply digital normalization, this, we really don't lose that many true uh, 20 mers, but um, we, we also, keep a very small number of the reads. And, and so essentially, when we try and assemble these data sets, we are using a very small portion of uh, the reads, the original reads, but we're getting, in many cases, a higher quality assembly. And it, it also greatly reduces memory needs. So you can see that, um, you know, depending on what the, the sample was, we can get anywhere from you know, 22.4x improvement in memory to uh, over 100x improvement. And you know, a constant factor is, is maybe not important in, uh, theoretically, but um, practically it, it's very important. So uh, you know, our, our soil metagenome samples, we went from not being able to assemble the data set to being able to do it in less than 256 gigabytes of memory. And uh, these results maybe aren't that useful uh, to the machine learning community, but we were able to uh, assemble uh, the Iowa corn and Iowa prairie data sets uh, using digital normalization and another technique that we call partitioning. And uh, we obtained about uh, the size of the human genome in, in sequence. And uh, also 5.3 million to 6.8 million uh, protein coding gene uh, uh, regions and, and the human genome has been estimated to have about 23,000 uh, genes. So there's quite a, microbes have are much more gene rich than um, than mammalian genomes or other eukaryotes. So it it really gives us a whole lot more information than if we were to just not use digital normalization and you know have a lot of the regions get thrown out because of you know very high coverage. So just to summarize, uh, DNA sequencing data sets are becoming prohibitively large and our solution we believe is to try and treat the data as a stream rather than you know, just a big block of data that you have to analyze. And also we've had great success with the Kalman sketch data structure and uh, of course the digital normalization algorithm that um, Titus and everyone else in the lab has uh, worked on really does even out the coverage level and uh, makes it a whole lot easier for um, assemblers to uh, actually assemble these data sets. And uh, our software is publicly available on GitHub uh, if you're interested. And it's under an open source license and um, we're always we're trying to build upon it and, and improve it. So that's pretty much everything. Um, 
the, this is the list of people who are, have been involved in digital normalization in, the, in our lab, the GED lab, and uh, collaborators, Jim TG at MSU, uh, and others, and uh, there are our funding sources. So, uh, thanks. I can't really give a better answer. I mean, certainly there are ethical issues to be worked out, um, but ultimately, I, I think it's an unresolved question. Uh, you know, yeah, I, I don't have much more to, to comment on other than, um, you know, it, it, to me, it would depend on the data set, um, and, and certainly, if you know, we're thinking about clinical samples, then you know. We would probably want to hold on to that, perhaps, but but maybe uh, basic science or something like that. Then I think it's okay to, not, to throw away data. But yeah, I, I, it's certainly something to consider. I think it's the same about being okay to throw away data. You go, you publish a paper, and somebody wants to challenge your conclusions, and if you don't have the data to be able to back them up, that it's really a way of reproducible research. Yeah, and our lab is actually very big on reproducibility, and certainly if you're publishing a paper, you need the raw data to replicate your results. So I, I would say that if you're publishing a paper, you need to have the original data, like absolutely. So, yeah. Any other questions? I actually have a quick question which dovetails into both of those, um, which is that since this is effectively a form of, uh, I guess, speculatively lossy, lossy compression, um, do you have any understanding of the properties of the error that are, that, that are made? In some compression schemes, say JPEG, for example, we know, not only do we know how does it compress an image, but we also know exactly what kinds of errors does an increase in pressure rate produce. So you, you can basically make an educated judgment with, with, with the JPEG image on whether, how far you can go or what, what is going to be the impact of pushing harder on the compression because we know the spectral properties of the algorithm very well. Do you have a, a sense, an intuition, or an understanding of what happens in terms of error uh, in the, with, with your approach? Yeah, we've, we've been looking into that uh, and currently one of the issues is that you know, before, uh, if you look at the context that an assembler produces, you know, once you enter a highly complex region of the graph then you know, the, that, that's where the contig ends, uh, just because you know, the assembler chokes at that point. But with digital normalization, we've found that the contigs, uh, we get longer contigs, it's just that uh, the very ends of the contigs get cut off. Um, and you know, we're still diving in to try and understand you know, where some of these uh, errors are, are coming from. But, yeah, it's something we're actively looking into. It's, you know, what happens when we are applying this type of lossy um, effect to the data. I can just put comment on the disability to your question. Uh, as, as Jason mentioned, Titus' lab is, is big on it. And the paper that was published for digital normalization, which was made available at the archive preprint, was actually made available alongside with an Amazon AMI image. Uh, that contains the data and the code right in front. Um, the full analysis takes about $4 worth of Amazon time. So basically, anyone in the world who wants to replicate exactly their analysis can boot up a virtual machine that has all the code uh, that is ready to go, and you log into a web interface and push, click, click on an icon, and it re-executes the analysis, and then that is executable code. So you can then tweak it in the web interface, change parameters, and, and basically play with it. So on their website, they actually made it available, which I think is great. Okay, so let's thank our speaker again. And we have a